All right, welcome back everyone to the MDA Engage Pompeii Disease Symposia. We are excited to jump to this next session. We have a lot of wonderful folks joining us for a robust roundtable conversation. Uh, Dr. Lau, I'll turn it over to you to kick off the uh, to kick off the presentation Great. or the Thank conversation, you. I should say. Yes. Thank you so much. So, kind of a uh, you know translation from our earlier talk about why is drug development so important and specifically looking at it with regards to a rare disease like Pompe disease. Um, and as I talked about earlier, it's a long process and there's a lot of commitment that's put into the development of one type of drug and ultimately it takes years to develop um, an approved drug. However, um, it, you know, we need to understand that the one particular treatment may not be the only treatment, and we may need a multimodal approach to Pompe disease. And so what we're going to do now is I'm going to uh, have each participant of the, of the panel introduce themselves and talk a little bit about the, um, you know, drug development specifically in Pompe disease. So let's start off with Dr. Barry Byrne. Hi there, everyone. Uh, I'm Barry Byrne. I'm a pediatric uh, physician scientist who uh, specializes in pediatric cardiology and has spent a significant amount of time of my career studying gene therapy viral vectors. Great. Okay. And Sean Durr? Hey there. I'm Sean Durr. I'm a 30-year-old male living just outside of Detroit, Michigan. I have laid on to Pompe disease. I've uh, been diagnosed and receiving treatment for just over two years. Okay. Mark Lyles, Dr. Lyles. Hi, my na name is Mark Lyles. I'm a general internal medicine physician, and I work with Amicus Therapeutics on their patient and professional advocacy team. Okay, and Amy Fisher. Hi, everybody. My name is Amy Fisher. I am a genetic counselor by training, and I currently work as the interim head of the patient advocacy team at Spark Therapeutics. Spark Therapeutics is a gene therapy company, currently a member of the Roche Group, and we have a clinical program for the development of gene therapy for Pompe disease. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. So a few ground rules before we start. Um, we want this to be a conversation, so we'll start off with some uh, structured questions. But this is a panel, is a discussion of thoughts. And no member of the panel is actually offering medical advice or individualized medical advice. Um, we're not going to, to discuss specific products by name, but talk more in general on the drug development process from all sides, whether it's pharmaceutical, as a clinician, um, as a patient or family member, okay? So we're gonna start off with the first question and I'll pitch it to the team here. So in general, in your experience, what is the clinical trial experience like for Pompe disease? I guess I can leave that off as a Pompe patient. Uh, it's, you know, it's a long process doing uh, a clinical trial. Uh, when I was first diagnosed in 2018, uh, I was ERT naive the enzyme replacement therapy. So I initially tried to get on a trial right away. Uh, they actually led me to my geneticist, which was a good thing. But uh, I was really quickly shown the parameters of what you, you know, need to be in terms of what they're looking for. And I think that's a big thing to note is if you haven't declined to a certain point, they're not too useful in a clinical trial, or if you find too much, or not really too useful for a trial. So I unfortunately had too good of lung function, so I tested out of the study and went right to current standard treatment. So I guess I'll leave off with that. You said you were too good for your pulmonary function? Yeah, yep, I uh, tested too good, and you know, I was like, oh man, I really wanted to be on a trial, and uh, kind of got to see now that, uh, you know, in order for something to go from clinical trials to being a drug, it's crucial that, that they can show the regulators, hey, this drug is making a difference. And with me not being too affected by the disease at that point, it would be hard to demonstrate that progression or lack of progression by being on a new clinical drug. Did you understand that at the time or is that some your point of view that you came to know later? Like at the time you were disappointed, right? That you couldn't be in the trial? 
yeah, I mean, I, I kind of came to know that as I went on, you know, it's not just something that, hey, I'm going to make a difference. I can sign up and change the world type thing. It's, you know, hey, yeah, you're great to have, but at the same time, we can't take you as a case study and show you as somebody who's improved on our drug because it's so hard with a progressive disease. Hmm. So it's important to understand that. Anyone else? Oh, maybe I can comment uh, because of having been in this area for a while, I've seen the approach of, of various sponsors to recruitment, to patient recruitment. And, uh, um, you know, as, as Sean pointed out, that there are sometimes very narrow criteria for inclusion of study. This is something I think um, patients need to understand when they look at a study design or the inclusion exclusion criteria on clinicaltrials.gov so that their expectations are, are met, uh, you know, in terms of volunteering and their ability to participate. And some, some sponsors have chosen very wide um, inclusion, exclusion criteria that would allow many to participate. And some have chosen very narrow criteria on the hope that that, that well-defined patient population will, um, will give a more uniform response to the drug. But just to say that to the patient community, that's, <clears throat> that's uh, something when, when it's not known uh, what the effect size or the ability of the drug to, to have an impact on the drug, uh, on the disease phenotype is known at the beginning of a study, um, that influences how subjects are selected. And uh, so it's not merely random um, decision making, it's a, it's a process that uh, biostatisticians influence to try to know how many, um, how many participants are needed to show a change over either the natural history or into the control group. So um, that, that's just the nature of, of learning as, uh, as these studies are conducted to see, um, I think as, uh, as Dr. Lau pointed out, there's some things that are not known about reversibility. And, and that's a critical question in the Pompeii space. Mm -hmm. Dr. Byrne, when you started, right, so looking back when there was no standard of care therapy, and now there is, and imagine what a, as you can see, like a, a patient not being able to get enrolled in the study, you know, personally, I see there's a difference. Thank God that there's standard of care therapy for, their, for Sean to go back on, but I'm sure before then, there was a different sense, a different, it was more Yeah, different. I think at the time, the original pivotal studies being planned for then myozyme, now lumozyme in the U.S., um, you know, it was a very difficult decision for parents to make of children with infantile onset um, disease who were facing critical decisions about um, support needed for them to remain eligible or survive to the point of the trial um, being initiated. So uh, that was obviously a, a very a disheartening to many families who, who didn't quite get there and to participate. And even those that have been long-term participants have seen some level of disease progression that was maybe unanticipated at the beginning, so expectations were set very high. Um, and then I think it's always the my observation with families is that if, if, you're, if the outcome really reasonably matches what the expectation was, people are satisfied. When the expectation is either uh, not matching that, um, what, what the likely outcome is, then that, that is disappointing for patients. And I think we'll hear more about that in the patient-focused drug development meeting tomorrow. Uh, but uh, so yes, it's better to have, uh, certainly um, access to some therapy, but you can keep in mind even some to some and in some parts of the world, this is still not available. Yeah. So there's, yeah. there's plenty of unmet need that still exists in the patient community. So Dr. Lyle and, and Amy, so when, and, and Ms. Fisher, when you're thinking about designing the trial or, or, or the inclusion exclusion criteria and thinking about your patients or the patient recruitment process, so what are you thinking about? You know, I'm sure you're taking into account the patient experience. So what are, what are those um, factors that you consider? 
Yeah, I think at Amicus, it's always challenging to uh, develop these types of trials, as Barry and Sean just mentioned, determining what the inclusion exclusion criteria are. Um, one of the unfortunate things, I know we talked about, Sean, sometimes people are too healthy or not impacted enough to be evaluated. But on the other side, there also is, it's really sad to me on a, many occasions when people can't participate because they are impacted too much. They cannot ambulate or they are already on some type of ventilatory support. So in those types of situations, there are other ways that you can include them in different types of trials. But I think um, making sure that every resource is made available to people who participate in clinical trials is extraordinarily important. And while that can be difficult to do on a global basis, um, making sure that you have the right team that's able to support, hear what patients' concerns are. And importantly, even from the outset, when we start designing a trial, we leverage the expertise of people who have Pompeii or who are living with Pompeii. And so having their input from the beginning is always key as well. Just to piggyback on that a little bit, I think that we've learned through those conversations with individuals living with Pompeii disease that there is an understanding that we have important research questions to answer as we move forward as a community to bring new therapies. And sometimes the tools that we have to calculate answers to those important research questions are less than optimal, right? Or perhaps they don't as accurately reflect the impact of Pompeii disease as someone might hope for. Um, but it's what we have, and I think that it's what we endeavor to do with the support of the patient community is explain what we expect to learn from doing those different tests or those different assessments, and also be forward-looking and think about new ways that we might be able to measure the impact of a particular therapy as it truly relates to someone's daily living with Pompeii disease. And I think if I put my genetic counselor hat on for a second, um, if someone is per thinking about participating in a clinical trial and meets the enrollment criteria um, and is ready to sign on, I think it's incumbent upon that individual, their entire healthcare team, to ensure that informed consent to participate really is informed. Um, you have all of your questions answered. You understand what's going to be expected of you as a participant. Um, you understand the follow-up plans, um, whether a, stu you know, a study may be designed for 52 weeks, but the long-term follow-up um, expectation is significantly greater than that as we endeavor, again, to continue to learn the answers to the important research questions. Um, and so I would just encourage all of you that are thinking about clinical trial participation, your effort is so appreciated, so necessary, um, and you deserve to be able to have answers to as many questions as you have before you get going. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So next question. Um, so what are the biggest challenges, in your opinion, to developing drugs for Pompe disease specifically? Like that. Well, I can probably just start there and, and echo what I just said in that sometimes we don't have the best tools or tools are particularly invasive or not, um, uh, you know, really something that somebody wants to put themselves through to, to measure the impact of a potential therapy. So I think that's one part of it um, in that we are challenged to um, sometimes incorporate assessments that really speak to the clinical impact of a particular therapy. And I think another element that um, we've hit on in, in several of your remarks earlier today, Dr. Lau, is that um, this condition manifests in so many different ways, mm -hmm. um, even within the same family. And when you have um, people starting from all different baselines and really having independent experiences as to what Pompeii means for them, it is a challenge to develop studies that allow for you to understand the overall safety and efficacy when you're starting from different places. And I think that lends to why we sometimes have what seem to be rather narrow inclusion criteria, um, but it continues to be an effort that we explore about, you know, should we have sub-studies or separate cohorts to try and address um, the different manifestations of the condition. Dr. Byrne, do you want to comment maybe in your experience? Um, yeah, th this is really why we've put a lot of effort into the best opportunities we can for modeling. So um, 
some number of years ago, we collaborated with Nina Raven to establish this knockout mouse model. Mm -hmm. Debate variations of that that reflect um, tissue specific loss of alpha glucosidase to understand more the pathophysiology, particularly the the impact of uh, of the disease on on the brain. Uh, including a, a, a version of the mouse which only is missing alpha glucosidase in neurons, and which in which we see actually a very similar phenotype to the one that's missing the the enzyme function in all the muscle cells as well as the neurons, um, and then uh, and then also made uh, two versions in in larger rodents in in rats that uh, represent the infantile onset disease and the and the adult onset disease at least the common mutation. Um, and so between those models and even understanding the natural history of the nat naturally occurring canine disease, uh, we hope that that will teach us more about how to, uh, what, what to measure and how, uh, how long those studies need to take mm -hmm. to look for an effect. I think one thing that really needs to come into play in the clinical trial space, and it's one reason why <clears throat> the, the MDA Care Center Network is, uh, is, is being mobilized to enable this, is um, we need to make it easy for patients to access these studies, for one, so they need to be in their community. Um, and secondly, the, we, we need to um, really consider what part of their general care this is and whether rehabilitative services are also gonna improve function in the mm -hmm. long run. Um, we, we often just expect that it's frankly kind of the magic uh, drug uh, in, the, in the case of uh, a genetic disease will completely reverse all the problems, but there are some of them are accumulated over many years that need, would need specific rehabilitative effort to, to get the best outcome. Right. Sean, do you have any comments on, you know, when you're thinking about your standard of care therapy now and, and what more could be done and, and some of the impacts or your expectations for the future? Uh, certainly. I mean, Pompe disease, it's, you know, a progressive disease. Uh, as Amy was saying, it, and even you, Dr. Lau, it affects everybody so differently. And I think that's almost the beautiful thing about the Pompe communities. We all have different stories and different manifestations, different progression. We all have similarities, but we all come together and hopefully push forward for better, better standards of care, better treatment. And with clinical trials and drug development, uh, it's huge that we all come together and support and push for new development. Uh, plain and simple without scientific jargon, if we don't come together as a community, and try to go into these clinical trials and make a difference, then these therapies are not gonna happen. They have a rare disease, and if we don't pursue these clinical trials, they're not gonna get filled, the drugs aren't gonna get developed, we're not gonna have new therapies. And hopefully, as patients and family are watching this panel, they think, you know, oh, the inclusion, exclusion, the different phases of the trial, you know, speak with your doctor, speak with your physician, and see what's right for you, because mm -hmm. new, new trials come all the time, and depending on your progression, depending if you have a child, depending, you know, on a lot of different circumstances, there is something that would fit in terms of safety, in terms of what you expect, and for us to improve therapy and treatment, we all need to do what's best to come together and figure out what's best for ourselves to help advance the community. Great, thank you. Okay, shall I move on to, so let's, looking ahead, right, so that whatever, what's on everyone's mind is what's on the horizon for Pompe disease, and gene therapy is obviously on the mind, and I alluded it to, to it in my lecture about, you know, we feel like this might be the cure-all, and um, so talk a little bit about what you know, what's on the horizon, and maybe also let's manage everyone's expectations too. So um, we can start with whomever, but so what's on the horizon and, and, and what's exciting, but also if you can comment about, um, you know, the limitations of that too. Manage. 
Well, I'll comment on what's on the horizon right now. Um, Amicus has already completed enrollment of a phase three study in Pompeii, which is on a global scale, uh, one of the largest ever done, and 123 people are participating. And we aim to have some data around uh, the first half of next year. And so it'll be quite interesting to see how that approach what the data are generated. But we also have a, a NASID Pompeii gene therapy program. Mm -hmm. So I think there are around 10 to 12 companies now exploring differing ways and complementary ways to potentially treat Pompeii. And so it's going to be quite interesting to see what all of the science learnings are from each of them. I think given the different approaches, it'll be uh, great to eventually one day sit back and see all of the data and see what who learned what and what also is now available. Mm -hmm. I'll just pick up on that briefly then. Um, so to share with you a little bit more about where SPARC stands, um, I mentioned in my introduction that we are um, in clinical development for a gene therapy program for adults with Pompeii disease. Um, like many other sponsors and institutions, we were impacted by the pandemic um, and currently the study is voluntarily and temporarily suspended. Um, we're very carefully evaluating not only with the patient community, but also with our sites and um, trying to make sure that everyone's as ready to go when it is appropriate and safe to do so um, and have continued uh, a lot of work um, at SPARC to ensure that we, along with our um, CRO partners, are doing everything that we can to expeditiously uh, start the study as soon as possible. Um, and I think, you know, as Dr. Lau alluded to in, in her talk, as it relates to gene therapy and what's coming next, um, certainly an incredible potential, um, I think from a transformative therapy standpoint, um, but a lot of unanswered questions that we still aspire to learn through our clinical development program, addressing things like safety, efficacy, predictability, are we seeing the same type of response when gene therapy is administered, and durability, how long will that response last? Um, and, it gets back to the first question about clinical trials. You know, these are very carefully designed experiments, but they are experiments. And we look forward um, with the support of the community to learning more about the impact of a potentially transformative intervention. Dr. Byrne? Yeah, I can comment. So um, our group here uh, at the University of Florida has sponsored uh, three gene therapy studies in Pompeii one in early onset disease, uh, one that's, uh, that's been completed and published, and one in uh, late onset Pompeii patients demonstrating an important point to amplify in a, um, an, a message that, that Heather delivered earlier. Um, the underlying principle of what we're studying both in adults and children is particularly uh, paying attention to the underlying genotype of the patients and particularly all those early onset patients who have low or no uh, enzyme expression or so-called crim negative or functionally crim negative patients um, uh, may be treated with uh, medications to avoid anti-drug antibodies from enzyme replacement therapy. We've determined the compatibility of those uh, drug therapies with a the gene therapy regimen that will be the basis for the infantile onset study that will start at the NIH um, in August. And so that'll be the third uh, study that's ongoing. And the purpose of that is to <clears throat> end the adult companion study is to demonstrate the ability to redose AAV vectors. Um, an important feature now that over half of those born with Pompeii now um, are identified by newborn screening. And uh, over the lifespan, the somatic growth or your body size increases uh, such that any gene therapy delivered to the muscle cells or to the liver for that mm -hmm. matter um, is, is ultimately lost through growth of those organs, muscle or the liver. Particularly the liver <clears throat> in early life is, is not um, suitable for, for gene therapy because it would lead to, um, in, in effect, immunization like one receives for other viral illnesses. And so that's the objective of those studies. Um, so we've shown in the adult study that redosing is possible. Mm -hmm. um, that um, that strategy has been employed in another study that now has enrolled six patients at the NIH. 
Um, and we, we think uh, this will be important to both uh, enhancing safety. Uh, this is an important aspect um, of what's necessary in the gene therapy space. Many patients may be aware of some tragic patient deaths in the past few weeks in another study uh, that's very relevant to these early onset patients um, where the, those, those, I think there's a worry in the patient community that um, this would, would be impacting the safety in other studies. <clears throat> so we do think that this approach will have some uh, benefit and, and that's what we hope to learn over the next year yeah. um, in conducting those studies. I, thank you. I, I left it to you because I, you know, it's been on the minds of um, most of my, again, I'm not a basic scientist and I'm a clinical trialist. So to, to understand the scene right now of all these um, gene therapies for a variety of disorders is that, that the idea of redosing and, and understanding how to do that safely and it's critical. And I think the point is even more uh, important in Pompeii because you're talking about treating over a lifespan. So and, and, and the increase in size and, and growth over time. And that's critical. So we're excited to see that on the horizon that you're addressing that. Um, in other um, gene therapy platforms that I'm dealing with, it's, it's not addressed yet. And it's, it's important in other disease states. So I, I do wanna answer one question that came through. And I think this is really important because it's talking about uh, from one of our patients out there, it's right now I find it difficult to keep up with participating in trials. To me, there should be one place that could be used for participation and one for researchers, two for participants. To post trials or whatever in section one and to fill out forms to see if we are eligible to fit that criteria. Right now, it's too cumbersome and I would love to be a participant, but it's just the struggle to keep up with it. Um, and if I could just get a call or an email so that's an interesting concept of, if, you know, we have someone who's interested, but they're overwhelmed with the information that's out there and all the different uh, trials. And even looking on clinicaltrials.gov, you put in the, the disease state, Pompeii, and, and even then you can get 30 studies, and not all of them are interventional. So it's very hard. So I think um, if you guys want to comment about how either in your company or in your university, um, how do you um, support your patients uh, looking for or understand, you know, seeing what's out there? Personally, I'll take two seconds. With each of my patients as a clinician, I take off my hat as a PI and I sit there and I go, all right, this is what's out there right now. Um, this trial is being offered here. I'm offering this trial. This is on the horizon. And I try to actually guide them to that. I also let them email me and say, hey, Dr. Lau, I saw this new therapy. And I try to debunk it if it's... Um, if it's a uh, less than scientific study, or if it's a, you know, I'm not certain if it's, it's a valid study. Um, so I offer that to my patients individually. But I think what he's speaking to is he's at home and he's trying to understand this globally. Um, how do the companies solve for this? How do you, um, you know, is there, Dr. Byrne, like how do you make sure that we, have, you know, our patients have access to this and understand it? Yeah, it, it's a it's a good point because it can be overwhelming and it's hard to continue to go back to those sites and search them. You don't want to. There's sometimes competitive enrollment for studies, and if someone isn't paying attention, and then a month goes by, uh, a study that might have been just perfect for an individual might be fully enrolled or at least in their region now that it's harder and harder to travel any distance. So, um, but I, I did see an idea that I think could apply to this area that, that maybe it would be um, appropriate for some kind of in, independent third party to consider um, the uh, a consortium of, of sponsors who are uh, recruiting patients for vaccine studies for COVID for example, um, have a website that allows patients or you know, candidate subjects to register. And there are about a dozen criteria that are asked about, and then you just wait and see whether you fit any of the characteristics. So I went through that and did that myself. I thought it was interesting the way, the way they structured it. And it's something that maybe should be available to the Pompeii community as a, as a way to stay up to date. Uh, and then you can hope that at least you'll be notified through that mechanism of what's happening and where um, relative, relative there to a given patient's characteristics. So, you know, for example, it wouldn't contact you if, if uh, 
five to ten year olds are 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 needed for a study as opposed to young adults um, and and that's something that that maybe we should look at as a community to make available to patients yeah just a couple of thoughts on that i mean i I certainly understand and hear the frustration and um, the sort of consequent you know throwing your hands up like I can't navigate all of this information. Um, a few things. One, I think that there is um, an effort on behalf of many study sponsors to develop language that's a little bit more helpful, say, than what you might find on clinicaltrials.gov, um, that um, community members can visit study-specific websites or um, even company-specific websites where they'd have all of the trials that they are sponsoring. But that doesn't necessarily address the question because it's still requiring um, effort on behalf of the potential participant to navigate through all of that. And so what I would think about perhaps is um, working with your advocacy organizations, working with MDA, for example, who have a clinical trial finder um, uh, available to those who are willing to put in um, some basic demographic information and other symptom information, and then it does the work for you in finding what studies um, might be appropriate. Of course, those studies have to be made known to the MDA or have to be extracted from clinicaltrials.gov. Um, but the AMDA also, um, you know, as an industry sponsor, we're able to work in a more um, maybe just a greater latitude. We have greater latitude to communicate with the patient advocacy organizations than we do directly with potential participants. Mm -hmm. And so we try very hard to make sure that the advocacy organizations like AMDA, like MDA, have up-to-date information from us around where our studies stand and how we, you know, the types of participants that might be eligible. I would agree with that and underscore that point. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity to highlight both the relevance and the importance of the PAOs, particularly those in the Pompeii space. And we enjoy working with all of them and they have a great opportunity and um, ability to take what we think of as a little bit more complex scientific language, but then to be able to distill that and share it at large with the patient community. I think their voice is a, a key part in ensuring that trials are enrolled and that people are aware of them. And then importantly, also aware of the data when the trials are concluded. Uh, it's great to work with those types of organizations. Yeah. Well, Sean, so you are a patient. So how do you keep up to, you know, how do you keep up to date on all the things that are going on and how do you keep informed? I think it's a crucial stress that, you know, with Pompeii affecting so many organs, so many muscles, you have a huge care team and you have to be your own advocate. And I think uh, clinical trials is, is part of that. Uh, you know, first and foremost, your physician that you see, whether it be a geneticist or a neurologist, you need to start there and you need to have a great relationship that you can reach out because if you hear about a study, I, I love being able to email my geneticist and say, hey, I just heard about this. What are your thoughts on it? Mm -hmm. I think you need to be able to have that back and forth that you can reach out to somebody and figure out if this is something you might want to pursue. Uh, clinicaltrials.gov, uh, as a patient, if you're not familiar, I don't find it too cumbersome. You know, you can type in late onset Pompeii, you can put your region, you can put your food in, and it lists the inclusions, the exclusions. I mean, there's a lot to take in. Uh, but that's a great resource to monitor. It's right from the government. So you're not getting any advertisements or any fake mm -hmm. information right in front of you. But uh, having the resource to talk with other patients is another great way of doing it. Uh, unfortunately, with Pompeii community, the biggest thing we have is Facebook. They're a Facebook group. And a lot of us, we've all found it great to ask questions about ourselves, ask about clinical trials. Uh, a lot of guys will post their pictures saying, hey, you know, I'm at so-and-so's blind trial. Here's me in the office and you can ask questions. It helps you know what's out there and what's available to do. And the mention of uh, the AMDA is another great resource. I think the AMDA is probably in the United States the best organization to reach out to. Marshall will email you back if you have any questions. We 
regarding a disease, even if you need help with your appointments or something's going on at the hospital, she'll help and make it happen. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's on you as a patient to go out there and, and not be stagnant. You have to be an advocate for yourself. You have to strive to want to do things. And if you do, I think there are ways to achieve it. No, that's important. Thank you. It's important to get your perspective because it is um, truly you're 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 experiencing it and to understand what's out there and then to have that resource in your physician, I think is important too, to make sure that you have a ringleader who's coordinating your care. In pediatrics, I'm pediatric trained, it's very um, it's it's second nature to have a ringleader. And sometimes in adult care we don't have that point person. Um, but I think in genetics, um, the geneticist can can uh, function like that. For me, I'm the neurologist, but I do coordination of all that care. Um, yeah, and clinical trials yeah. Yeah. Hmm? yeah, I got lucky from my geneticist. Uh, when I got diagnosed, it was through a neurologist who had never heard of Pompe disease. He just happened to give me the blood test. And the only reason I found my geneticist was uh, I typed in Google Pompe disease and one of the sponsored ads from one of the clinical trials, which it worked. I clicked on, I filled out my information, and two days later, I was at a visit, and I met the geneticist, and I said, I'm seeing you, because you have you know, a dozen patients with Pompeii, and it just works. So, Great. It's all about, like you say, having that supreme person that you can talk with, and they actually know what Pompeii is. That's huge. Right. All right, we have a couple minutes left. I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to ask my own let me see my own question here um okay so thinking about um well uh, there's a couple questions i i'm still keen on you know we have gene therapy or we have a, an improved enzyme replacement therapy and dr Byrne alluded to this though that it's not the only answer that we have to think about the fact that our patients have a progressive disorder with end organ damage and we have to look at adjuvant therapies as well. Again, I know, um, so, you know, for, it's important for my patients, they have questions, which hopefully will be addressed a little bit later today in the rest of the, in, in the rest of the forum, is talking about, you know, the uh, role of rehab, the role of um, other medications to promote growth of, of muscle um, or nutrition and everything. And it's really hard in a clinical trial because you can only test out one drug at a time. Um, but I know that Dr. Byrne has looked at the role of other um, adjuvant therapies too. So, you know, certain things when I've enrolled in a trial, um, they have caveated, as long as you're consistent in your physical rehab routine, as long as you're on the supplements that are approved, you can stay the same. But at some point, I think in the future, the, the landscape for testing is we're going to have to see how did this gene therapy or the improved enzyme plus something else like a, a muscle regimen or extra, like, that's important. What do you see? Um, do you see that in the future studies, Dr. Byrne? Yeah, I know I do think it's critically important that there be a specific uh, rehabilitation prescription that's followed. And if, if it's really necessary to understand how that, how, what magnitude of that impact is, then it would be included in a, in a study in some of the subjects and not in others, or it would be included for part of the study and not for another part. For example, um, one could could study the natural history in a subset of patients without the exercise intervention and then add it later, or in, in another group, start with that and then take it away and mm -hmm. see what the effects are. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it because the standard of care for those things and access to services is so different, unfortunately, across uh, the patient community. So I'm probably not sensible to rely on them. And you're right that this is what sponsors do, but it does, um, it's rather inconsistent if you actually track activity uh, in all the participants. <clears throat> Some have very aggressive rehabilitation mm -hmm. regimens and have access to home care and, and others do not. And uh, yeah. so it's, it's uh, something that needs to be standardized. I, I agree. I, I do see that. And I track it as a, as a faithful principal investigator. But you wonder, you wonder about the patients that have less activity versus more activity who are very um, well supported from that aspect or their dietary regimen and, and such. So that could be a confounding mm -hmm. factor. Um, okay, last 
maybe one last question. Um, how can patients and families um, accelerate the drug development process? So we talk about the researchers. We have the bench scientists trying to develop and looking for new therapies. We have the translationists trying to actually do the therapy. But how can the patient themselves or the family uh, help in this process? Mark? Yeah, I think of making raising awareness, ensuring that people do know what the opportunities that are out there, as we just discussed. But I think also having a family or friends and others to support an individual. These types of studies are not um, very easy always to do and can be very intensive from a time or a travel commitment. And so being able to have that support system, most of the companies do work with external parties that help to facilitate um, and help to facilitate the participation in a clinical trial, whether that's for scheduling of travel or reimbursement or those types of activities. I think um, making sure that people have all of the resources available to support them, both from other entities besides the sponsor, but importantly also from family members and friends. Okay, anyone else? Sean, do you want to comment how, sorry, I'm also trying to answer, I just saw some questions come in, but um, if you can tackle that question and I'll move on to one final question. I mean, I'll sound like a broken record. Uh, just got to get in and do it uh, as a patient, as a family member, see what's out there, have an open mind, at least look at it from a consider it because, you know, there's no, there's nothing holding you back from looking into doing a clinical trial. You can always research it. You can always decide, no, you're not wasting anybody's time by investigating whether it's right for you. And as a community, for us to advance, we have to not only demand the better treatment, but we have to take part in making sure that. Yeah. And they're not all interventional trials, too. You could participate in survey studies, natural history. You can have, you know, certain... Certain studies are just simply answering um, forms. You don't have to necessarily commit to some more invasive study. Um, you can participate and contribute to the knowledge base just by you know, filling in surveys at times. Um, so there is a, I did see a question come through. Um, let's see, in question about gene therapy, I think we are somewhat mentioned this. Um, Dr. Lau mentioned that their gene therapy won't fix the muscles that are already affected uh, to a degree. Is there any study going on for those muscles that were already affected if they have weak legs and is wheelchair bound? So it's a little bit more complicated than just saying it's not fixed. There's potential atrophy or an organ damage. Um, but I think Dr. Byrne, you mentioned to it about that combination with we have. Yeah, there, there can be orthopedic deformities, loss of muscle mass, but the muscle is, uh, can regenerate to some degree. So I wouldn't completely give up hope that there'll be some improvement in strength. It may not lead to someone with prolonged non-ambulation become, start to walk again because of the orthopedic uh, problems that, could, that are often associated with prolonged seated position um, we see also in our patients with Duchenne dystrophy. Um, so there are, you know, it's obviously important gains to be had in upper extremity function as well and in respiratory function, which is a key quality of life issue for patients. Um, we do think that some of that <clears throat> weakness is actually not only generated in the muscle itself, but in the communication between the nerve and the muscle cell in the in the neuromuscular junction and uh, where that where those uh, signals are transmitted from the spinal cord to the muscle, <clears throat> so that that's something that can uh, this that cell can still be present and just not functioning normally and not and gone. Certainly, if that cell is gone altogether, uh, like in many other neurodegenerative diseases, that can't be brought back. But it, the goal would be to try to maximize the function of every functioning part of the neuromuscular system, so both the nerves and the muscles together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that goes to another comment here. It's important to understand the difference between damaged muscle fibers versus um, atrophy from non-use. So again, um, you know, it's a more complex. It's not all or nothing, but we do have to manage our patients' expectations that 
I've run a trial with a distal myopathy where patients came in expecting that they would all of a sudden get their foot drop back or something like that to that degree. But it's not an absolute, it's a continuum. It's managing expectations. It's appropriate informed consent. What are our expectations from this disease stabilization? How much um, return we can get? Um, I do see another question. Um, there was one about using um, sugar. Ah, okay. Oh, we're going to save that for nutrition. Yeah, that's a good nutrition question. All right. Any final thoughts? Um, synthetic muscle, replacing the thigh muscle with synthetic. Again, it's looking at trying to regenerate muscle. Is there, is there work in regenerating actual muscle tissue? Um, again, it was more of a Dr. Byrne question. I think there's therapies to help promote growth, you know, the clenbuterol, um, but not necessarily synthetic muscle. Did you get the question? Um, yeah, may, I guess my comment would be that, that really our own regenerative capacity that we have built into the way muscles work is actually, interestingly, through damage is how we build new muscle. There obviously has to be as much regeneration as there is, or more regeneration than degeneration. So we just have to make sure that all of those early cells uh, that influence the um, the, the that muscle regeneration are healthy enough to recover. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think I think that's the end for now because we have a, a great long list of others to speak about nutrition, exercise, genetic questions. Um, I want to thank the panelists right now um, who joined us today: Dr. Barry Byrne, Sean Durr, Dr. Mark Lyles, and Ms. Amy Fisher. It's been a great discussion. And I believe I'm gonna turn it back over to Elise to talk about the rest of the schedule today. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Lau. And thank you to all of our panelists as well. I think that was a very nice, robust conversation and we're really thankful and, and appreciate all the information shared. Uh, as Dr. Lau said, we do have quite a few uh, other presentations that are coming up here this afternoon. Uh, we are going to get started. We're going to take just a short break. So let's come back around 1.20 and we are going to kick back off with Stephanie Austin. She is going to be presenting on best practices and future considerations for clinical care of Pompeii. So we will see you all back here in about six minutes. Thank you.